All right, I think we're ready to get underway. We've got over 100 people logged in and uh, I wanna get things kicked off. I'm Joe Stewart, I'm the Vice President for Governmental Affairs at the Independent Insurance Agents of North Carolina. And we are putting on today's event in cooperation with the Independent Insurance Agents of Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, that meets on a regular basis in Charlotte to bring in speakers on topics of interest to insurance agents all across the greater Charlotte metropolitan area. And we had planned originally to do this event today in Charlotte as part of the regular schedule of that of, of that organization. And because of COVID-19, of course, we were not able to, but uh, the organization was very gracious and the two candidates running for insurance commissioner had originally been scheduled to be there in person, also very graciously agreed uh, that we would hold the same type of event, but do it virtually. Uh, Nick Oxner, who's a good friend and a reporter with WBTV in Charlotte, very graciously also agreed to serve as the moderator for today's event. Uh, we're going to start with Wayne Goodwin, who's the Democratic candidate for insurance commissioner, and he and Nick are going to chat for about 30 or 40 minutes on a variety of topics of interest to uh, those that are following this race closely. And then immediately following that, uh, Wayne will depart and Mike Causey will come on and Nick will similarly converse with Commissioner Causey for 30 to 40 minutes and that's today's program. So without further, further ado, I'll turn it over to Nick. Great. Thank you, Joe, and uh, thank you. I'm gonna call both you and Commissioner Causey Commissioner because I, I think we can and we should. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and I'm not, I did not prepare a long introduction because I think this audience uh, probably has a pretty good idea, uh, generally speaking, of, of who they're hearing from today. But I wanna start um, by just give us a brief background, uh, overview of your background and tell us why you wanted to be insurance commissioner in the first place and why you want to be insurance commissioner again. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back here at the Independent Insurance Agents of Mecklenburg County. As y'all recall, I uh, regularly visited with you and spoke with you during many lunches and many other meetings over, over the years. Uh, uh, but again, thank you so much for, for the hosts today. Uh, fairly broad question, but I'll uh, remind a lot of the folks about my background. Um, I was born in Hamlet, just down the road from Charlotte, uh, there on, on uh, Highway 74, actually in Gaio, a little, little farming community outside of Hamlet in Richmond County. My father was a farmer uh, and a grocer. Uh, my mother worked in the textile mills, uh, neither went to college. Uh, we, we had some family members that were in insurance and banking, but, but uh, by and large, we were farmers and grocers and textile and hosiery mill workers. I was the uh, graduated from high school valedictorian, uh, Richmond Raider. Y'all may have heard of the Richmond Raiders there in Mecklenburg County. We tangled in football, uh, uh, have for, for several decades. Um, after, and of course, we went to Charlotte when I was growing up for culture and shopping. So, uh, so that Charlotte was a great place to visit as I was growing up. Um, I attended UNC Chapel Hill on a Moorhead Scholarship, as, as also as a U.S. Senate William Randolph Hearst Scholar. Graduated with honors from political science and decided that that um, that I was going to do something different than farming. And I originally thought about engineering, but of course they don't teach that at Chapel Hill. So I went into law school and uh, I went back home to practice law. As y'all know, the worst industrial fire in, in modern times is in my hometown, and that got me focused on not only on insurance and workers' comp, but also on, on the fire service. Uh, during my uh, time practicing law there, I, I opened a couple law firms. I would uh, help folks, uh, a lot of uh, uh, families. I worked with insurance agents when they had questions and concerns. Within a short period of time, I was elected to the legislature. And I, hope that my, I hope I'm answering the question as fully as you wanted there, Nick. Uh, but I was elected to the legislature at, I was 29 and served four terms uh, there, focused on insurance law, uh, and chaired one of the judiciary committees, and anytime the independent insurance agents or the firefighters or anything that, that involved uh, matters that Jim Long had concerns about, uh, I was one of the go-to people for that. Uh, after serving in the legislature for four terms, and by the way, in, in between there, I got married, and uh, I have two kids, my daughter Madison and my son Jackson. Madison is a, a App State freshman, and Jackson is a seventh grader. Uh, but um, after I finished serving in the legislature, Jim Long, our, our beloved insurance commissioner who served 24 years, asked me to join him. And I served as our assistant commissioner of insurance for four years, uh, working with him, drafting legislation, traveling, visiting fire departments statewide, meeting with insurance agencies and insurance agents statewide. And to my surprise, everybody's surprise, he uh, decided at the last minute not to run for a sixth term. And... Uh, and he had some health issues. So I was elected in 2008 
as our insurance commissioner, reelected in 2012. And, um, and the reason I'm running, uh, I think that was the last part of your question uh, there, uh, is that I, I believe that my work is not done. Uh, I've, you know, when this is one of those jobs, one of those specialty jobs, one of those jobs that requires a high level of, of experience and, and understanding as best one can the complexities of so many things, whether it's insurance, math, actuarial science, uh, risk mitigation, uh, all the things that the fire service entails and, and engineering, meteorology. I mean, it's just so much you got to know a little bit of something about uh, that I was just getting into the, into the, really into the swing of things. Uh, and we'll talk about that in terms of my record in a moment. Uh, but I just felt like the reason I'm running is that I, I don't feel like my work is done. The 2016 election, like a number of elections, were decided by factors out of our control. Um, you know, baseball, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes it rains, as uh, Bull Durham movie says. An election, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And my race was the third closest statewide race. Uh, and a difference of 0.4% uh, was the difference. And uh, I feel like that that um, there's more to be done. And I'll be happy to, to talk about that. Uh, again, 2016, I believe, was an anomaly. And we have a lot of things that require uh, someone who's the most experienced, most qualified, and has the ability to dig in deep on issues and, uh, that an insurance commissioner of my, uh, with my background is needed starting in 2020. I promise the questions will get more specific from here, but they might get harder. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, that's okay. That's all right. It's all good. All good. I, I, you know, these open-ended questions, you never know. I mean, that's uh, but I, I, I no, hope that's, I that's fine. That's fine. That's good. Uh, well, I, I'm curious from the time that you joined Commissioner Long, uh, to the time you left the agency, uh, what did you see change and what about the job of insurance commissioner did you see change and evolve uh, in, your, in your tenure at the, at the department? Well, there are a lot of changes. And of course, uh, when I uh, started as assistant commissioner, there are many folks that Jim Long uh, had as the subject matter experts who had been there 10, 15, 20 years uh, or longer. Um, and when I was elected, I decided that why, you know, why change some work? And I held on to uh, everybody, all subject matter experts, because I did not want to have a, uh, a uh, earthquake uh, it shift in terms of interpretation of uh, rules and regs and admin and consumer protection and uh, helping agents with concerns they've got and so on. So, but one of the things that I have uh, recognized as I went from being the assistant commissioner to, to serving as commissioner for two full terms is that there is a level of modernization that's needed and it's easier said than done. Uh, you know, we do, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, you know, our system is, is unique. Some say it's outdated, some say it's not, but that regardless, we need to have, uh, you know, more folks who are, have um, extensive complex understanding of the markets and of the law uh, and of actuarial science and, and, and helping to think outside of the box because consumers more than ever need folks who can guide them. Uh, agents more than ever need folks who understand the work they do. So as we're seeing a huge number of folks, either, uh, either uh, Mr. Calls you bring in folks, Mike bringing folks in, Commissioner Calls bringing in folks in, or people just retiring, it is apparent that the next commissioner our best staff, the most qualified, experienced staff. It should not be based on party whatsoever. It wasn't during my administration, and it won't be in my next administration. And, uh, and I think that's what we need, is that there needs to be, a, a, uh, given there's a large number of folks that are retiring from the Department of Insurance, we need to have the best and most qualified folks do national searches uh, so that whenever insurance agents, whenever consumers, when you know, when anybody calls on the department, they know they're going to get somebody who has an answer or who can help guide them through a very complex process. And um, and also realize too that, uh, and this is something which I think is important. Uh, it's a matter of accountability. And I think that the you know on my watch, uh, I was the hearing officer for a number of hearings, and we need to have given what we've gone through the last several months with again just there haven't been any actual hearings held on rates. Uh, I think that the public and the uh, agents and everyone, uh, they need us to have transparent hearings. And I, I'm the only one in this race that's actually done that and have, and have a legal background to be able to be a, a judge essentially and have a, 
hearings on on rate filings and the like. So so smart targeted reforms that help us modernize without causing insurance rates to increase and having um, a, a, a search for the very best, most qualified personnel, not based on party, but based on their expertise and based on what uh, they can provide uh, for the citizens of North Carolina. I've got rate making questions, Scholar, don't worry. But first I wanna ask and ease into the kind of modernization question a little bit. You talked about the need to be insulated from party politics and partisan politics. Do you think that the commissioner of insurance should be an appointed rather than elected position to help insulate from some of that? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, that question comes up regularly. There are 11 states that elect their commissioner of insurance, but there, there's many other executive branch offices that are elected down in North Carolina and also across the country. Um, you get, you've got, unfortunately, for better or worse, you've got politics no matter what. And I, I think that it's actually more transparent to have an elected commissioner. Uh, when you have these governors in other states that appoint a commissioner, it tends to be some donor to the to a governor or somebody who is a, who's worked for a special interest and was you know, somehow slid into that position. It's very rare you have someone who's a consumer advocate that that is appointed to those positions. It's usually because of politics. I think the best, most transparent way, uh, and again, no system is perfect, is for us to continue to elect our commissioner of insurance. Um, you know, I, when I was first elected, I was part of the uh, the the move to have a publicly financed insurance commissioner's race. I was the only, the, uh, the first candidate to do that uh, as a publicly financed insurance commissioner's race to get big money out of politics. And unfortunately, the, the new legislature that came in in uh, 20, goodness, I guess after the 2012 elections, they eliminated the public financing part. So we, the insurance commissioner candidates, uh, uh, have to campaign and fundraise the same way every other statewide race does. I think the best way to address this as you know, uh, through your work as a, as a preeminent journalist, is that is, is sunshine is the best disinfectant. And to have transparency, transparent hearings, uh, having elections for, uh, for the insurance commissioner's office is a way to give the people the power to decide who's most qualified, most experienced, and not have a governor of any party just tap somebody who happened to be a donor or who happened to be a big wig in an insurance company somewhere to be the commissioner of insurance. That does not serve the public well or agents for that matter well at all. Um, this is an opportunity for folks who, are, who have been insurance agents or have been insurance attorneys or have been insurance professionals and experts to put themselves out there and have the public decide who is the best qualified and most qualified to be in one of, one of these statewide executive branch positions. Glad to hear you talk about transparency. Certainly, we both agree on that. Uh, so you talk about uh, rate making and, and the need for modernization. Um, I guess my, my first question on that is, do you, would you do away with the rate bureau or would you reform it? Um, well, let's start there. I would reform it. Uh, I know Mr. Causey, every time he ran for office starting in 1992, said that he wanted to eliminate the North Carolina Rate Bureau. And as legislature after legislature de determined that if you eliminate the Rate Bureau with one fell swoop, you're gonna see insurance rates go through the roof, skyrocket for auto and homeowners insurance. Um, I've heard many people who have described our system, even though it, it, is, it is the last of its kind, that for the most part seems to be working here. We have, we have the ability to compare policies to policies, apples to apples with the uniform policy requirements. You know, instead of having hundreds of insurance companies make filings throughout the year to raise your rates or try to raise your rates multiple times a year, there's one aggregated filing in February for auto insurance. And then uh, you also have the uh, workers comp insurance uh, in the fall. And of course, homeowners insurance could be at, at any point. So what I have preached and have practiced, it's not just saying it, is that having smart targeted reforms. And one of the things which I did was working with agents working with industry, working with lawmakers, working with the public, came up with some uh, reforms that, that allowed little by little for there to be more flexibility in the rate bureau system that we've got. And I think that's what we need to do more of. If you have a wholesale elimination of a rate bureau, uh, you would see an upheaval in the market. You'd see prices go through the roof. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, insurance is about stability, among other things. Uh, so the best way to approach this is through a very smart approach 
Uh, and, and even even uh, Mike Causey has apparently stepped back from his, his original proposal of eliminating the rate bureau. So even he has had a Damascus experience, it seems, on this, is that you need to take uh, smart, measured approaches to reforms. And those reforms should be based on what uh, input there is from our independent insurance agents, uh, from consumers, from lawmakers, from the industry, uh, because we want to do what will ensure stability, uh, a competitive insurance market, uh, fair and lowest prices as possible, and the other things that that we have enjoyed in recent, in, well, in the last several decades. So smart, targeted reforms, don't, don't not status quo, but making progress as we go. And that's and as a former legislator, I know how we can do that. Um, that that's important to know how how to make your case for these reforms with the legislature. Walk me through one or two specific reforms that you made when you were commissioner, and then give me a couple examples of the smart targeted reforms you would begin working towards if you were elected again. Well, I mean, one big example is that, you know, um, I would get calls, emails, so would our consumer services division all the time. They'd say, well, well I see this ad on TV, uh, or I read this ad in, in you know, somewhere, but I heard it on radio that says that, that this particular bell or whistle, this particular service, this particular product, uh, you know, whether it was the, you know, uh, you've seen these devices that keep track of your, keep track of your driving and they can use that to, to, uh, to lower your rates and, and all the other things, uh, uh, accident forgiveness, uh, you know, all those sorts of things. And people would hear these, these uh, TV advertisements and at the very end of them would say, I'd say, not available in North Carolina, or well, it may list a couple other states, but it would include North Carolina. And people would say, why is it not available here? I want, I want that. I want to have the opportunity. I want to have the choice to do that. And uh, what, what I did working with uh, one of our prime experts, he's retired now, uh, Bob Mack uh, and others, is that we came up with a proposal to allow insurance uh, companies to, to make filings with us, uh, with the Department of Insurance, that would be reviewed to allow these types of these bells and whistles, given that you know there are certain requirements are met, and uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, and we we certainly want to offer that. Now, just keep in mind that as as we talk with the public, is that in the in many of the states where they have had some of these bells and whistles before, they also have much higher prices uh, for you know by and large. So we want folks to know in a transparent way that when you you know if you seek some some reforms uh, without appropriate oversight, then you may wind up paying more for the reform uh, than what you intended. But we do want to give folks the choice. And that's one of the things that, that we did is to, is to uh, allow the rate bureau system to, to have these, uh, these types of filings for, uh, for special products and, and services. And, I, and going forward, I want us to do more of that. That was an experiment. It was during my second term. You know, these, these types of jobs, you, you, you learn more as you go. Uh, in terms of okay, what works? If it doesn't work, you go back into the into the into the lab and, and cook up something else to try to see what can help address consumer needs and insurance agent needs. And it was starting to work. Uh, and then, of course, uh, and then I was uh, no longer in the office there. So I would think we we want to review it and see what else we can do to move us further down the road to have more more uh, these bells and whistles that that uh, that we need. Um, I think it's it's going to be also important. And when we think about, and I know we may get into this a little bit later on, in terms of reforms. When I was first elected, the ticking time bomb was coastal homeowners insurance. And we need some reforms there because the solution that I helped craft with the ticking time bomb back then, and I know we, we, many of the folks on, the, on this call maybe may recall what we did to address that. It was applauded by everybody, uh, but, it, uh, but it's not perfect. We're, we're 11 years out from that solution. And my plan all along was that if I was still the commissioner is that we would review the solution to the coastal homeowners insurance crisis and look, look at what we need to uh, update that because it is now, you know, it, is, it is now woefully, I'm afraid we're gonna, we are having the early stages of another coastal homeowners crisis, which impacts folks in Charlotte, by the way. You know, if, if, you know, if there's a blow up uh, on the, in the east, it actually Im impacts prices and pricing and rate making statewide, particularly in our urban areas. So that's what I would do is, is look at uh, further tweaks and, and ref smart targeted reforms to prevent that, that time bomb from having its, uh, its trigger uh, occur. It's as though you saw my list of questions and you knew that's what I was going to ask you next. So, you, you know, it, I've, I, I don't think anyone would argue that, you know, Hurricane Matthew, Hurricane Florence, we're seeing more named storms earlier 
last later into the season, uh, Hurricane uh, Laura, you know, down the Gulf Coast recently reminded us, um, you know, did the fix that, that you just talked about, is that geared to, to address the, the increased amount of hurricanes and the more catastrophic damage that we're seeing with hurricanes more frequently? I, mean, I grew up in Fayetteville and my birthday's in September. So, you know, I had the Fran and the Floyd birthdays, right? So remember, you know, those were, were not, you know, not every two years or so, but that's what we're starting to get. And, and so would your solution have addressed that in the current situation we face? And if not, give me some specifics uh, on what you think we ought to be doing right now. Well, uh, and, this, 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 and we could spend a lot of time on this particular question because, as you know, with any legislation, there are compromises made. And uh, one of the compromises was, well, what, what do you set as the, as the trigger for uh, reinsurance to be paid what, uh, by the insurance industry? What do you set as the trigger? You know, what, at what point uh, is there, you know, what's the worst catastrophic situation when you have uh, you know, hurricanes and, and tropical tropical storms. What's the worst possible situation that you can allow for that would help us rebuild uh, not only in our communities but also through the insurance markets, which we all depend upon uh, to have homes and to have uh, you know communities. And one of those is that when we uh, compromised on it and had the solution to the ticking time bomb of homeowners insurance is that we based it on what if we had another hurricane hazel i know hazel predates both you and me nick because it goes back to 1954 when my mama was little and that was the barometer and, it, and the barometer was okay what what type of damage would a hurricane hazel cause today and, you know that was category four storm etc or more and that was based on a four billion dollar uh hit to north carolina now, we are seeing more active storm seasons. We are seeing, just like we saw just a few days ago, you had two major storms coming into the Gulf of Mexico at once, of which, you know, we still are impacted in the western part of the state uh, by storms that come up through the Gulf. But the, the solution that we put in place was based on the assumption that what if you had two major storms in a given year? And uh, I can't recall if it was category three, but it was, it was essentially, what if you had two major back-to-back -back storms in one year? And we need to look at how do we uh, take into account the increased activity uh, in the Atlantic Basin and in the Gulf, uh, that if, if you have more than two, should we, should we, have, should we uh, readdress the statutes and the rules and regs to, uh, to account for an even livelier season. And I think that we may need to address the $4 billion mark uh, as, as a trigger, because we, we had different numbers in mind, but that was, that was what we decided upon. So, so that's one of the, that's when I mentioned about y'all said to be a meteorologist as an insurance commissioner and be a mathematician and, and all the other things and, and know who to go to in those fields, is that that's what a lot of this is about, is about uh, math, science, actuarial science, risk mitigation, and looking, looking and understanding charts and graphs and working with all the cons climatologists and, and the like that, uh, that we have in this state. So, so that's, what, that's, that's what I would do is that one of the first things I would ask is, the, is uh, internally, but also ask the legislature to, uh, to create a uh, very quickly uh, a, a, a study committee to report back as soon as possible on what changes need to be made to clarify and amend and update uh, our approach to you know, to you know, how insurance and property is impacted uh, by the increased number of storms. I want to move on and talk a little bit about health care. Um, do you think North Carolina's current insurance regulatory framework and, and the, you know, current laws and system we have, do you think that is allowing us to meet the needs of people during this uh, current pandemic? Uh, and if not, how would you change that? Short answer is no. Um, the number one issue for most, in most polls that I've seen, uh, is access to affordable health insurance. And we only have one company, you know, for the longest time that wrote in every county in this state. And we're thankful for that company that, that has that is written uh, for so long in the state. But one of the errors that the legislature made. This was after the supermajority, uh, after the 2012 elections did, uh, and then also Mr. Causey took Mike took the same position, is that they opposed a state health exchange, which baffled me to no end. 
Uh, you know, we've had, we've had the Affordable Care Act now since 2010, and it's been in full effect since 2014. And one of the options that it gave states was that, do you defer to a federal health exchange where the federal government pretty much decides everything for you as a state and as a consumer, or do you have a state-based health exchange? And I'd rather North Carolinians decide the fate on health insurance for North Carolinians. And it made no sense to me. Uh, and I found, I learned that it was obviously politics that the, the legislature, uh, because they wanted to make a point, they wanted to, it wanted to uh, bankrupt the Affordable Care Act in Washington. The legislature and Mike Causey uh, supported the federal health exchange instead of a state exchange. When we were on track, in fact, even Tom Tillis, when he was Speaker of the House uh, in the legislature, uh, bef you know, before they got a supermajority, he was for this, is that with a state exchange, we had multiple health insurance companies that had already filed their paperwork, had gone through the process of having actuarial reviews and analyses done that would have competed with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And Blue Cross Blue Shield welcomed that. They want competition. They don't want to have to take everybody. They, you know, it's, it's important to share the, you know, the, the exposures on health insurance uh, with as many companies as possible. But because the legislature and because uh, folks like, like Mike uh, said that no, they wanted to make a political point, they wanted a federal health exchange instead of a state-based exchange, those companies withdrew their filings. And, and that's something which I think we need to, re, we need to re-examine uh, is that we need to, again, put politics aside. What's in the best interest of policyholders? What's in the best interest of folks who are looking for affordable, accessible health insurance? And having greater control of our destiny, having a state-based exchange, whether you have an elected commissioner or appointed commissioner, having a, the states that had a state-based exchange did much better with rates and did much better with competition. So that's one of the things that I would do uh, is that. And of course, um, and this may be, this is secondary, but still very important, is that we need an insurance commissioner that recognizes that no matter who's in office in Washington, no matter who's in charge in, in the legislature and the governor's, governor's mansion, is that it is imperative that we protect health insurance coverage for pre-existing conditions. Whether folks support the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, or whatever or not, people agree on that. They want, they want to have access to health insurance that covers their pre-existing conditions. Uh, and I'm the only one that's speaking up on that uh, in this race. So, so that's, that's what I would do is uh, go back to where we were in the respect of having state control over our health insurance destiny, work with all partners to attract more insurance companies here. Like, I mean, there, there are other states our size that have many more companies than we do. And that's going to take some change in our statutes. Uh, and I would work with our legislators to do that. You need somebody who understands the legislative and the statutory processes uh, to uh, to amend our system so that more companies will come write health insurance. It is no accident that we only have, you know, the one big company and they've had a few others that have, that have come in, but we need to have more health insurance companies will write in every county statewide. And that's one of my goals. Um, I would say uh, just a quick reminder to provide a balanced forum for both candidates. This is your 10 minute warning. I was just about to say, we're coming <laughs> into the end rows here of the questions. Uh, and, and so I have just a couple more to wrap up. Uh, you've talked throughout this of, of things you want to do. You've mentioned you were a lawmaker. You've talked about things that need to be changed in the law. You just did. Um, if and you you work insurance commissioner while uh, the you know the opposite party controlled the general assembly, how would you describe your working relationship with the general assembly um, when you were commissioner last? It was actually very good. I mean, you know, uh, as a former legislator, there's a certain, res there's a respect that you have for the process. And uh, I respected the legislative process and, and the legislators of both parties uh, respected a former lawmaker. And, uh, and, and I regularly was asked to present and did present to committees chaired by, uh, by uh, legislators of a different political party than me. Uh, and regularly, and Jim Long was the same way. Uh, many and they, they, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not gonna call out names, but the many Republican lawmakers said that I was the only Democrat they voted for uh, because of my approach to things. Is that when you approach insurance regulation, when you approach consumer protection, it shouldn't be partisan. And uh, so I got along very, very, you know, very well. And uh, and even when there are occasions whenever we disagreed on things, it was always respectful. And I knew that if if there if there was a budgetary reason or a procedural reason 
or even a policy difference on something here and there is that uh, I would go back and plan till the next year to make my case again. And, and, and I think that was, that was why we were able, for example, to get a lot of the reforms in uh, that, that were made. And then also, uh, that's one of the reasons why we were, for the first time since the creation of the Department of Insurance uh, in the, you know, 1899 and in a few decades thereafter, is that uh, I worked with the legislature to consolidate all of our disparate offices. We were spread across the state. I mean, spread across the city of Raleigh, also across the state, and uh, able to persuade them to agree with me to have us all in one building. And we're in the Albemarle building because of my work, because of my team. It's not because of the current commissioner, because my, I spent four years working on that. Another sign of, of how I'm able to, to work very closely and get along with, with members of both political parties is that on my watch for the first time, we created a Charlotte regional office for the Department of Insurance. And it just makes sense. Charlotte is a financial hub, a banking hub, an insurance hub. But did you know that the current commissioner has eliminated the Charlotte office? They just closed up. They're going to Gaston County. Uh, that's a shame. Uh, I spent two terms working on getting the, the, all the bells and whistles, make sure everything the I's are dotted, T's crossed. They have a Charlotte regional office. And just in this less than one term since I left, the Charlotte regional office is gone. And that's a shame. But it, but it took working with Republicans and Democrats to get policy changes made. Uh, we worked together to, pr to protect our, 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 keep our car insurance rates low. And we also, again, work together to have uh, the, the Collins Consolidated Office uh, in the Albemarle Building and to have that Charlotte Regional Office. Uh, if I'm reelected as our commissioner to a third non-consecutive term, Charlotte will have an office again. It just makes sense to have that. It makes no sense to have moved the office out of Charlotte. A, a final question here. Um, say you win, you take office, the General Assembly comes back for the long session, the end of January. What are your top three priorities that you're going to hit the ground running and, and want to, to see changes implemented? Uh, first of all, I've already mentioned that since access to affordable health insurance is the number one issue, is that working with the legislature to uh, amend our laws so that state so that insurance carriers will want to come come to North Carolina, if that means a state a state health exchange, uh, whatever the whatever we need to do to attract uh, health insurance companies to come here to give folks more choice. Uh, I, I also include Medicaid expansion and 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 the like. Uh, second is that uh, we need to again provide strategic reform so that we continue to have among the lowest car insurance rates in the country and among the lowest homeowners insurance rates. In the, in the southeast. And, and the, so the second thing I would do is that given it's been a long time since we've had actual hearings that actually occurred, uh, is that I would hold public hearings on auto insurance and on homeowners insurance so the public and agents and others uh, know uh, what we are, you know, what uh, is going into the, what, what the secret sauce is, well, how rates are made. Um, and I, in terms of a third thing is this, uh, is that we haven't talked about this before yet, but the insurance commissioner is also the state fire marshal. And you need an insurance commissioner who can, uh, who can walk and chew gum at the same time, do both of those things. And it, and it just baffles me that North Carolina is the last state in the country to, uh, have, to uh, allow cancer coverage for firefighters. You know, this is the number one issue for the professional firefighters, and they've, they've endorsed me because I'm the only one speaking about this. So a third platform that I would, I would uh, work on immediately is that you have the full a full force of the insurance commissioner's office and my support for legislation that provides presumptive cancer coverage for firefighters that develop cancer as a result of their exposure to the toxins of, of, of fighting for us and protecting our homes. It is shameful that the Department of Insurance has been silent, has been mute on this. And you can ask the firefighters. They said that, that they, they don't understand why the current commissioner is supporting the cities on this. You should support the firefighters. And it just every other state has done it. So the three things, fighting for changes to our laws so we have greater access to affordable health insurance, fighting to ensure that our system is reforming to keep our car insurance rates as low as they were whenever I was there. We had the lowest average car insurance premiums in the nation on average. And then third, fighting for cancer coverage for our firefighters. It's the right thing to do. Now I've got a long list of other things regarding certificates of insurance and other uh, priorities of the of the independent insurance agents, and I look forward to working very closely with them as in years past to help uh, ensure that independent agents 
uh, are able to have their livelihood and can protect consumers in the ways that they believe are best as well. Wayne Goodwin, the Democratic candidate for insurance commissioner in the 2020 election. Thank you so much, sir, for taking time and being with us today. We appreciate it a great deal. At this time- Thank you uh, so much. I ask for your vote. Thank you. But at this time, we're gonna switch out the two candidates. Our, uh, take a, just a few minutes to get the technology set while we bring in the current commissioner, uh, Mike Causey, who will also spend about 40 minutes with Nick talking about a variety of subjects of interest to this audience. I'll use this occasion to say that we're also having the two candidates appear at the October 6th day of the IIANC annual convention. Uh, that will be moderated by Tim Boyum, the host of Capital Tonight on Spectrum News, uh, providing each of those candidates an opportunity to talk about these issues and others uh, for all of the attendees of our annual convention. So make sure you're keeping your eyes open for that, IIANC members that are um, soon and should be and are already have undoubtedly gotten email communications about the uh, upcoming annual convention. We're the, uh, getting ready to get Commissioner Causey on. Commissioner, are you there? I'm here. How are oh, you? right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I will turn things uh, back over to Nick now. Thank you, Commissioner Causey. Good morning. Good afternoon. Time has no meaning. Uh, <laughs> we're going to jump right into things, and our audience is probably going to recognize some of these questions. So I'm, my intention is to ask virtually the same things that we just went over with uh, Commissioner Goodwin as well. Um, thanks for being with us. I want to start. Just tell us, give us a, the the elevator pitch about your background why you wanted to be insurance commissioner and why you think you're the best choice to continue being insurance commissioner in this election. Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, I started my insurance career in Charlotte uh, with MetLife, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. I was born and raised on a farm in Guilford County where I still live today. I grew up on a produce farm. We had some cattle and livestock. Uh, the house was built in 1907 as a hunting lodge by the chairman of Remington Arms. My great grandfather managed the lodge and the farm and trained bird dogs. So I grew up around hunting and bird dogs and a, and a lot of history. Uh, so I, I live in the same house today that my great grandfather, my grandfather and my father lived in and is named after Mr. Dodge. It's called Dodge Lodge Farm. But I went to college at Wake Tech, studied engineering. I have an associate's degree in civil engineering technology. I served in the United States Army. Uh, I'm the only uh, veteran in this race. I served as military police uh, overseas. I also played in the Army band. I came back home, worked as a field engineer and on major construction projects. So I know how to read a blueprint and know what construction's all about. I went back to college at UNC Charlotte, studied urban and environmental engineering. And while at UNC Charlotte, I got recruited into the insurance industry. So I made a 180 degree turn and uh, spent 12 years in Charlotte uh, from the bottom up as an agent, uh, sales manager, agency manager, and became a general manager for another company operating in Charlotte and eventually moved back to my home county of, of Greensboro. Uh, I'm in the Alamance community of Guilford County, even though I have a Greensboro address, it's uh, rural uh, Guilford County. Of course, a lot of the farms out our way are growing houses, sort of like Charlotte. But it's an honor and privilege for me to serve as your insurance commissioner and the state fire marshal. And I just uh, have been honored to, to work with the agents all across the state and I will say I'm the only non-attorney ever elected to this office and the only insurance commissioner that actually worked in the insurance industry as an insurance agent. So uh, I'm asking for an opportunity to continue our work for another four years. Uh, tell us a little bit about, um... You know, you've been in office almost four years now, and, and tell us how things have changed from the time you took office till till today. Well, the, things have changed in a positive manner. 
Uh, we have most of the same people that I inherited from the previous administration. So there were some good folks already in place. The, uh, uh, the subject matter experts are, are all there. And as these people retire, we're doing our best to recruit the best and the brightest uh, and, and get the best possible people to, in CPAs, actuaries, uh, attorneys, and all those other risk management disciplines that, that we need. But uh, what I did was have a simple goal, Nick, was, was to make the office more user friendly, uh, cut the red tape, streamline a lot of the processes, and just made it more user friendly. And I've, I received positive feedback every week. Uh, I had people that were not of my same political party that actually worked against me, tell me we thought this place would be turned upside down when you came in. We, we were braced for the big storm, but it never happened. You've been a pleasure to work with. And last year, we helped over 258,000 people in this state. And you can call us any day, Monday through Friday, eight to five. We have people on the phones in our consumer services division, and they are very professional, no matter what to call. Uh, last night, I got a call from Eastern North Carolina from a farmer, and it was a federal crop insurance issue. I have no say, I have no control over it, but uh, the policy had, had added hurricane protection. It wasn't paying. And I told this farmer, hey, look, that's not my area, but I tell you what I'll do. I'll make a call to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and see what I can do. I did that this morning, and the USDA is working with this farmer to try to see if they can find a resolution. So no matter what the issue is, if the public brings it to us, we're going to try to help and find a solution. Great. Well, you, you talked, you touched on just a smidge, the bipartisan nature of your job. And um, do you think to kind of insulate the Department of Insurance from politics, do you think the commissioner should continue being elected or should the commissioner of insurance be an appointed position? I absolutely think the commissioner should be elected. Uh, I think the former commissioner and I agree on this. If you look around the country, uh, there's only 11 states that elect insurance commissioners. Uh, 35 commissioners in the United States are actually nonpartisan, but they're appointed by the governor. So to me, that makes it more political. And I think the public has a bigger voice and better say, and it's more transparency when it's an elected office. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident uh, had, had we not had an election in 2016, I wouldn't be commissioner today. So. I, I want to talk a little bit continuing down the theme of modernization or changes or what have you. Uh, what is your position on the uh, rate bureau? Do you think North Carolina needs to continue to have a rate bureau or do you think uh, the state should, should make the reform and do away with it? I think the over the years, the, the Rate Bureau has served us well. It's, it's uh, maintained a stable and healthy insurance climate. We have some of the lowest uh, automobile rates in the nation. We've never had the lowest automobile rates, but during my term, we've consistently been the sixth to the eighth lowest in the nation with automobile insurance rates. If people want to see high automobile insurance rates, you look at Louisiana, in Michigan, two of the highest in the nation. Uh, homeowners insurance, we're the lowest in the Southeast, right in the middle nationally. We'll never be the lowest because of our coastline, but if people wanna see high homeowners insurance, you look, Florida has the highest in the nation. That's followed by Mississippi, uh, Texas, uh, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, all those have very high homeowners rates compared to North Carolina. Uh, we have worked hard over the past four years to bring about a more free market system and the industry is divided. Uh, I've listened to all sides and you have insurance companies that 
that love the rate bureau. They don't want anything to change. You have other companies that want to completely the, abolish the rate bureau and have a totally free market system. And you have other companies that want some combination of those two. Well, the, the facts are, it doesn't matter what I think is up to the legislature. Now, we've got a good working relationship with the rate bureau. Uh, we've had public hearings uh, when the rate bureau has asked for rate increases. I've said no, I've scheduled a court date as required by statute. And we've had public hearings where the public could come in and voice their concerns. And we, we have kept rates very, very low while at the same time keeping a healthy insurance climate. And I'll put my record up for the past four years against my predecessors past eight years anytime on rate increases. Do you think there need to be any changes or adjustments to the rate bureau? If you, it sounds like you want to keep it, uh, would you, yeah. do, do we need any more modernization in this state? And if so, yes, give us yes. some examples. I think so. Uh, we've done a lot already to uh, allow companies to uh, change things without going through the rate bureau. And uh, again, anything we do has to go through legislation. So I'm open to suggestions. I listen to all sides. So I'd like to hear from the agents, from the company CEOs on what changes they would like to see. And we will go to bat. One example is consent to rate. I heard a lot of pushback from agents on the, the difficulties in getting the wet signatures. And we heard that loud and clear. We heard all kinds of examples of people having nightmare scenarios because they didn't sign the form. So we went to the legislature and we got that passed. And I've heard positive feedback from the agents, how much they appreciate what we did on the consent to rate. Great. Um, let's move on. You touched on it just slightly. Uh, I want to talk about hurricanes and coastal uh, insurance and the coastal insurance marketplace. Obviously, we're getting more and more frequent and stronger hurricanes in North Carolina and across the country. Um, and most, you know, we've we've seen more hurricanes hitting during your term as as commissioner. How have you uh, dealt with that? What are you doing to make sure that? Um, both that insurance coverage remains for coastal homeowners, but also, you know, doesn't raise the rates too high for those of us who live, you know, four and five hours from the beach. And that's a good point, Nick. We have had back-to-back -back hurricanes uh, three out of the last four years. And I can tell you, as we all know, Hurricane Florence was devastating to uh, 23 southeastern counties were declared disaster areas. Uh, I want to thank the independent insurance agents for uh, their grant. They made a grant to the Department of Insurance that allowed us to buy a, get a real good buy in a, a motor home. A couple in Stanley County had bought this motor home new and decided not to travel anymore. It had about 30,000 miles. So with the grant money that the big eye gave us, we were able to uh, upfit this motorhome to a disaster command center and it came just in time. It, it got ready, field ready the same week that Hurricane Florence hit. And we were able to go with the insurance industry to set up insurance camps in all of these areas in southeastern North Carolina. We work closely with the charities, uh, Red Cross, Samaritan's Purse, Baptist men, Methodist men, other churches that help people that did not have insurance. We help people get their claims filed. And what I learned from Hurricane Florence was shocking that so few people in this state had flood insurance. It was less than 2%. At the time Hurricane Florence hit, uh, North Carolina families had less than 135,000 policies for flood. So we worked with the rate bureau and the industry to develop uh, 
private flood insurance policies. Those forms have already been approved and we believe that within the next year or so, insurance industry will be able to offer private flood to the public. Do you see any other changes or reforms that need to be made when we look at issues of reinsurance and, and coastal rates and, and as we see the increase of uh, you know, hurricanes on our coast, is there anything else, do you see a need to do anything else to insulate uh, you know, inland homeowners from, from having to make up or uh, you know, absorb some of the impact of, of that increased financial liability? I think there's always uh, room to think outside the box and room for improvement. Uh, we've worked with the uh, Joint Underwriters Association closely, and we've been involved with this Fortified Roof Program, which is really helping with hurricane resilience. Uh, we need to work with the building industry, which we've been doing to uh, build homes along our coast that are more resilient to the hurricane winds. And here again, anybody that has an idea, suggestion that, that you would like to see the Department of Insurance or our engineers uh, look at, we'd love to hear from you because we're all about helping people and holding down rates as low as possible. Let's talk about healthcare a little bit. Of course, the, uh, the thing that's top of mind, I think for everybody, uh, is the global pandemic. Do you think North Carolina's uh, healthcare system, our insurance marketplace, has, has well equipped us to provide healthcare coverage and healthcare to North Carolinians throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? I do. Overall, I, I do. I think there's still room for improvement. We still have too many people uh, that are, are caught in the middle that, that don't have insurance, that can't qualify for Medicaid, and they, they don't have uh, good health insurance coverage. But early on, when we first heard about coronavirus, I reached out to the health insurance industry, asked them to get with the medical community and come up with ways to provide insurance coverage for telehealth visits and virtual visits. And that was done in, in short order. So I, I commend the insurance industry and the medical community for working together on that to make that possible. So do you support Medicaid expansion? You talk about the people falling in the gap. Would you address that by supporting Medicaid expansion? Well, that's not up to me. That's a legislative decision. It's totally up to the legislature. I think there's been some good debates. What I've heard, uh, I've heard both sides, pros and cons. The, the cons the, are people are saying there's tremendous fraud in Medicaid and Medicare. And and I don't think anybody would argue that point. So I'm hearing from people, let's, get, let's address the fraud part and bring that in line and then we can look at expansion. But, but that is not my call, it's totally up to the legislature and I'll be happy to work with the legislature and gather any facts that we can. Uh, I'll just say working with the our meetings with the U.S. Attorney on health and health care fraud is, is the number one fraud nationally. There's a lot of insurance fraud out there, but we're working hard in our department to get a handle on insurance fraud and, and get tough on fraud so that that'll hold down our cost. And so if, if, um, if the state doesn't expand Medicaid, it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon that, that might change after the election uh, or could change after the election. What else would you do to try to bridge that gap to make sure more families can get the health coverage they need and at a price that they can actually afford? Well, one thing we've been doing, we've been doing for four years and that's uh, working hard to bring more health insurance companies into North Carolina. We, we brought dozens of new health insurance companies into this state. What I'd like to see is more health insurance companies willing to write the individual health insurance. Uh, competition is a good thing and we need as many companies as we can get willing to talk to people and write health insurance coverage. We need affordable health insurance and affordable health care. 
And we do a lot to help people. We help seniors uh, through our Seniors Health Insurance Information Program. We help seniors with uh, Medicare. We help, even if somebody has a Medicaid question, that's under Department of Health and Human Services, but we take the call, we get the information, and we forward it over to DHHS. Uh, if they call us about long-term care or any other health related question, we will address it and do what we can to help. And I can't tell you how many times our program, Smart NC, has helped people uh, negotiate hospital bills, doctor bills, and save, um, save millions of dollars uh, overall. You touched on something that I, I didn't get a chance to ask Commissioner Goodwin about, but we have a little bit more time together here, so I'll, I'll ask you to expound a little bit and just talk about uh, how important you see the issue of fighting insurance fraud. Um, what more can your office do to fight that fraud, and, and, and how do you see that impacting the insurance marketplace today? Well, it's a, it has a huge impact. Uh, I heard when I was campaigning in 2016, uh, you know, just to give you an indication how little uh, people outside the insurance industry know about the insurance commissioner's office, I'd be traveling the state. I'd walk into an area in the county and, and say, I'm Mike Causey, I'm running for insurance commissioner. And people would say, what kind of insurance do y'all sell? I said, well, the department does not sell insurance. They regulate insurance. And very few people realize that we have sworn law enforcement officers that can make arrests in all 100 counties. We're over fire departments. We're the chief building inspectors. We regulate collection agency, bail bonds, uh, manufactured housing, uh, just a multitude of things that come under the regulatory authority of the Department of Insurance. But the first place I visited in 2017 after being elected was our criminal investigations division. And I wanted to know how bad is insurance fraud in North Carolina? I'd heard all these horror stories and I'm told that they're averaging 20 criminal complaints a day. That's over 5,000 a year and the department was only able to fully investigate about 12%. To me, that was a problem. I asked why, and at that time, we only had 15 sworn law enforcement officers in the field that could make arrests. We had 20 sworn law enforcement officers, but five of those were in management. So I did go to the legislature and work with the legislature and so today we have 45 sworn law enforcement officers. I, I think that's not nearly enough, but to put it in perspective, in 2016, the Department of Insurance made arrest in 57 out of 100 counties for insurance fraud. That means 43 out of 100 counties had no arrest for insurance fraud. By the end of 2018, we had made arrest in 97 out of 100 counties, and we had doubled the number of arrests. And over the past three years, we have brought back over $14 million in restitution to victims of fraud. So I'm tough on fraud because if we don't stay tough on fraud, it'll drive up our insurance rates, and we need to hold down those rates in every way possible. I think we've got 10-ish minutes left, so I'll ask you a couple wrapping up questions. I, you've talked a lot about your relationship with the General Assembly. There's a chance that control of the General Assembly could change after this election. We're a very purple state. Um, do you think, if, if you were to be reelected, uh, do you think you could continue the working relationship you've touted throughout our time together today uh, if, if it, the General Assembly were controlled by the other party? Absolutely. I, I have, my office has a good working relationship with the governor's office and the other state agencies. And I'll give you an example. When the tornado hit Bertie County, uh, the same day uh, I had planned to go visit. I didn't know the governor was going up there. I called the governor and let him know that I didn't know he had planned to go, that we had already planned this trip 
uh, to, to help give out tarps and help people that needed help with insurance claims. And um, he said he would see me up there. And Congressman Frank Ballantyne was up there. We had our uh, mobile command center that was financed through the Big Eye Grant. We were giving out tarps. We had two tents set up and we were there to help people that needed help. And Congressman Balance stood under our tent and he said, this is what government is all about, is helping people when they need help the most. So I view my job in a nonpartisan way, helping people that need the help most. You know, there's been a lot written about the uh, Lindbergh case, the Greg Lindbergh case, and all of those things, but it was the previous commissioner that allowed all those companies to come here and get started, and those were things that, that my administration inherited. And we could go back to uh, Cannon Surety, which was another problem case. So it's important to have tough, stringent regulations and prevent fraud and root out fraud and corruption at every turn. If you win re-election in November, uh, you come back to Raleigh, the General Assembly's back for the long session, what are your top three priorities that you're gonna tackle and pivot to uh, if you start a second term? Well, number one is to keep a healthy insurance climate because we have to have a healthy insurance climate to give people the best chance of gaining coverage and the mo the lower at the lowest possible rates. Uh, the second thing was to continue working with insurance agents as we have with uh, working groups and task force and get the feedback that on any changes that they see or any issues they'd like to see addressed. We want to keep working on closing the gaps. I inherited a lot from the previous administration. We've been closing gaps on health insurance. We've been closing gaps on the uh, flood insurance and other types. And we'll continue to work on that. And the third thing is continuing to be tough on insurance fraud and working with our fire departments. I've, I've been all over this state multiple times in all 100 counties, and I fully 100% support the presumptive cancer benefit for all firefighters. We fully supported that from day one. The good news is there's not been a single case that I know of that, that wasn't covered through our industrial commission through workers' comp. So that's the good news, but I do agree we need to continue working on legislation to make sure that benefit is provided to all our first responders. Do you have a specific legislative priority list that you would turn to and, and implement if, if you were uh, still in office come this January? Yes, we, ha we have an agenda of things that we're currently working on, and we, we were, we're already working with legislators now on some of those things, bail, some bail bond reform legislation, some, uh, uh, again, closing the gaps on some of these in insurance products, and just tweaking on some of the Chapter 58 insurance statutes. Okay, Commissioner, I think our time's about up. I'll hand it back over to Joe. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. Sir. And Commissioner, thank you very much for taking part in this forum. We appreciate this. It's a great opportunity for the community of independent insurance agents, and we invited in others, uh, captive agents as well, to view today's forum. And so this was a great opportunity for both candidates to share their thoughts and insights on what they would hope to accomplish should uh, they prevail in the 2020 election. And again, Joe, I, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, Commissioner. Go ahead. I thank you, Joe. And if, if people want to know more about my campaign, it's my name with NC at the end, MikeCauseyNC.com they can get more campaign information. If they want to know more about the department, it's ncdoi.com or ncdoi.gov. But thank you for, thanks to the big eye for, for hosting this. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and thanks to the Independent Insurance Agents of Charlotte Mecklenburg for allowing us to partner with them 
on this event today. Uh, one quick note before we wrap things up, I encourage everyone very strongly to re remain uh, committed to participating in the election this year. If you're not registered to vote, please do that. Uh, make sure that you have plans to either vote early or vote on election day. Uh, the democratic process is the hallmark of a American government. And so we want the fullest possible participation in the election among all of the folks that are interested in insurance across North Carolina. Uh, this is Joe Stewart. I'm the vice president for the independent insurance agents of North Carolina's governmental affairs program. Thank you so much for participating with today's event and safe travels for the rest of the week.